Good morning and happy Easter. You've made it this far. This is the last Sunday of my sabbatical. I will be with you next Sunday. But for now, I would like you to turn your attention to the last little bit of the Gospel of John that we have. We've got John 10, 11 through 18. There are some biblical scholars who believe that the Gospel of John is so far flung from the other three Gospels that it doesn't so much portray any kind of historical conversation so much as it portrays the thoughts of the next generation about the stories that they were given from Jesus. And I will say that this is the majority view. Um, I normally hold with the majority view of biblical scholars, but not when it comes to the Gospel of John. When it comes to the Gospel of John, I'm in the minority camp. And I tend to think that the Gospel of John preserves Jesus's words most closely. And it, it, it differs so radically from Matthew, Mark, and Luke because Matthew, Mark, and Luke had very different agendas. And I think that's why John is sometimes so confusing because I don't presume that Jesus was understood by his followers. In fact, I presume that the man who knew he was God confused mortals. That seems reasonable to me. And, and in the church's struggle, for indeed, there were a lot of struggles in the first couple of centuries. In the church's struggle to understand, okay, but who is Jesus? Like, who, who is he? Was he fully a person? Was he fully human? Was he fully divine? Was he half and half? Was he like half heavy cream, half skim milk? Was he fully human for a bit, but then he becomes fully divine? Was he fully human and fully divine the whole time? And while the church settled the question, fully human and fully divine, in case you're curious, and the church settled the question centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries ago, that doesn't mean they were right. We hope they were. And that doesn't mean that it's still not a valid question to ask. That doesn't mean that in our understanding of it, even if it's true, yes, he's fully human, yes, he's fully divine, that we understand what that means. And so, Personally, I do think, yes, he was fully, he was fully human and fully divine. Um, but I also wonder, and partly because of a verse here that we just read, I wonder if we don't take the crucifixion in a way Jesus perhaps did not intend us to take it. And I quote, where am I? Here I am. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. He's talking about living and dying. He's talking about death. He's talking about the fact that he's not just the master of death 
or just the master of life, but he's the master of both. That he has the power to lay his life down as if it were a suit he was taking off. And he has the power to pick it up again as if it were a suit he's putting on. A suit of clothes or a suit of flesh. He has that power and no one takes his life. And it's so easy when the church year swings around and we go through Lent and we strike upon Palm Sunday and Holy Week, the agony of Good Friday, and right up until we proclaim Christ is risen, either at the Easter Vigil or an Easter Sunday morning. It's so very tempting. And the church absolutely entices us into this vision. And I get caught up in it too, that Jesus had his life taken from him. That Jesus was put to death by. And you know, in the circumstances of this level of form, yeah, the Romans crucified him. Yeah, it was instigated by the Jewish authorities. Yeah, there were plots, there were plans. Yeah, he was killed as an insurrectionist. But here's an interesting fact. He wasn't an insurrectionist. They were worried that he was going to come and be a political power on earth. But that was not why he was there. Jesus was killed for insurrection. But Jesus was not an insurrectionist. Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Jesus was often juxtaposed against the Roman authorities and the Roman overlords, but he was not here for that. He had a much bigger game that he was playing. And it had nothing to do with the Roman Empire, the piddly, tiny, ineffectual, short Roman Empire. Now, viewed from a historical perspective, it wasn't piddling, it wasn't tiny, it wasn't ineffectual, it wasn't short. But viewed from the cosmic perspective, it was. So what if this actually was part of Jesus's plan? What if he came in order to teach us a very, very specific lesson that might be painful, not for him, for us? What if the master of all reality came to teach us that love will always win and that it's the only important thing. By dying and proving that death is not as real as we think it is. Because he didn't just do fancy tricks and say, look at me, I'm awesome, you're not. That wasn't who he was, that wasn't what he did. He did 
crazy things to get people's attention and to teach them an important lesson. And so what if the point of Jesus' death was actually his resurrection? Because he has the power to lay his life down and he has the power to pick it up again. And while you and I may not have that power, We follow him and we listen to his teachings because we are certain, or at least we suspect, that he might have been right. Amen.